Welcome to Horseshoe United Methodist Church. I'm Reverend Monica Monk. Uh, I notice when I watch on uh, live stream, people don't necessarily introduce themselves. We just assume that everybody knows who we are. So I'm trying to make a point of introducing myself each time. I'm Reverend Monica Monk. And whether you're joining us here in person or whether you're joining us uh, via live stream, we're glad you're here. It is good to come together in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and offer our worship and praise and to share God's love with one another. I invite us. Please join me in the call to worship. Lord, you know us so well. We thank you for your presence in our lives, even when we don't recognize it. This day we have gathered, coming from a week of unexpected happenings and events which have surprised us. Make us ready to become stronger witnesses for your love as we receive your word and find our spirits and lives healed.
what God has been doing in our lives this week. We witness to the hope that we have experienced. We witness to God's faithfulness. We witness to our experience of God's love. So where have you been a witness to hope this week? Our source of hope is in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I invite us to lift our voices in praise and sing glory. this day. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we come to you this day with so many things on our hearts and minds. Some of the events this week have been very positive and have caused us to celebrate. But we are constantly besieged by worries and doubts and fears. And these negative things crowd out your word. Slow us down. Continue to pour your love on us because we really hunger and thirst for it. Forgive us when we allow all the negativity to drown out your word. Fill us with your peace, love, hope, and joy that we may be better disciples for you in this world, which is in so much pain. We are so grateful for this community of faith, this family that you have brought together and created. And for all anywhere who hunger and thirst for your healing, reconciling word. You know all the things that are on our hearts today, and you bring us together in love and support. We ask your healing mercies with those who struggle with illness of every kind. With feeling lost and marginalized. For those who mourn and for whom the darkness of sorrow enshrouds them. We ask your growth-producing growth love for all those who celebrate and rejoice today. And we lift up these names before you, Lord.
Be with each one of us and all those whom we have named in our hearts before you this morning. Help us to reach out to each other in compassion and support. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, and we pray together as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A reading from Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. So now there isn't any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. God has done what is impossible for the law since it was weak because of selfishness. God condemned sin in the body by sending his own son to deal with sin in the same body as humans who are controlled by sin. He did this so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Now, the way we live is based on the spirit, not based on selfishness. People whose lives are based on selfishness think about selfish things, but people whose lives are based on the spirit think about things that are related to the spirit. The attitude that comes from selfishness leads to death. But the attitude that comes from the spirit leads to life and peace. So the attitude that comes from selfishness is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law because it can't. People who are self-centered aren't able to please God. But you aren't self-centered. Instead, you are in the spirit. If, in fact, God's spirit lives in you. If anyone doesn't have the spirit of Christ, they don't belong to him. If Christ is in you, the spirit is your life because of God's righteousness, but the body is dead because of sin. If the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your human bodies also through his spirit that lives in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it isn't an obligation to ourselves to live our lives on the basis of selfishness. If you live on the basis of selfishness, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the actions of the body, you will live. All who are led by God's Spirit are God's sons and daughters. You didn't receive a spirit of slavery to leave you back again into fear, but you have received a spirit that shows you are adopted as his children. With this spirit we cry, Abba, Father. The same spirit agrees with our spirit that we are God's children. But if we are children, we are also heirs. We are God's heirs and fellow heirs with Christ. If we really suffer with him so that we can be also be glorified with him. The word of God for the people of God. I don't 
know if we actually need a sermon after that. That's pretty good. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, open our hearts and our minds that we might hear the word that you would speak into each one of our hearts this day. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to you. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The title of my sermon this morning is The Gift of Family. And when I think about family, Because it is so different from one family to another. Or even with different parts of the same family. Some families do everything together. Other families see each other a couple of times a year and that's okay. Some families have strong traditions and a solid sense of what it means to be a member of that family. Other families, not so much. Some families are very close. They check in with each other every day. That's not my family. If I talk to my mother once a month, that's doing good. Other families don't speak to each other at all. Some families have your back no matter what. And some families will kick you out if you embarrass or shame them. Sometimes family is a blessing. And sometimes it's a challenge. Sometimes it's a mess. Sometimes it's a source of pride. And sometimes it's a source of pain. And sometimes it is all those things all at the same time. We are born into a family, whatever that might look like and however that might function or not. And we also find family along the way. Many of us have had to or have chosen to build our own family. Family is seldom easy. And yet a true family is a real gift. In the verses just prior to our passage for today, Paul has been talking about the wonderful freedom that we receive through life in the Spirit as we walk day by day with Jesus. In this passage, particularly in verses 12 to 17, he proceeds to demonstrate a further blessing that comes our way as believers. We become part of the family of God. Now last week I used the metaphor team. I suggested that the Holy Spirit works with the church as a team and that perhaps living our faith is a team sport. I don't know where that metaphor came from. That's the first time I ever used that My sermon just kind of went in that direction, and I went with it. This week, I want to use a more familiar metaphor for the church and for the people of God in general, family. And this week, I also discovered that Horseshoe has a term that has caught on here that y'all use to describe yourselves, and that term is chamily. Chamily, which means church family. Chamily. I have never heard that anywhere else, so y'all go ahead and claim that as yours. We're working on the copyright, and people will have to pay us for it. Yes, yes, yes. I added it to my dictionary on my computer so it doesn't get a red line under it every time I type it. It belongs to you. Claim it. 
Maybe we ought to rename the greeting time at the beginning as Chamily time. Like or the Chamily shuffle as we do the church shuffle. <laughs> we can work on that. Turn to someone near you and tell them, I'm glad you're part of my Chamily. In our passage for this morning, Paul talks about family, about the church as family, and he calls us the children of God. Now, we are not naturally God's children, though we are God's creation. Belonging is a gift. Membership in God's family is a gift of divine grace. And it becomes realized as we walk in the Spirit as Christian believers. Paul makes it clear that we have received a great gift as God welcomes us into his family. So what does it mean to be a member of God's family? Well, the first thing it means is that we receive the gift of life, true life authentic life and that comes only through relationship with the author and creator of life apart from membership in God's family we are destined for death living according to the flesh leads to death because the flesh binds it destroys it kills the flesh demands self-gratification and self-glorification, and yet it offers no ultimate satisfaction. It is a dead-end existence. And just a note here, Paul uses the term flesh a lot, and he's not talking about our physical bodies. He's talking about anything else we put in the place of God whether that's ourself or anything else. I like the way the Common English Bible translates, translates it. That's the uh, translation that uh, Casey read. It, instead of flesh, it uses the word selfishness because that conveys the meaning of what Paul is trying to say when he talks about flesh. But putting anything else in the place of God, including ourself, leads to death. And death may mean living separated from God in eternity after we leave this earthly existence. That's one definition of hell. Death can also mean living an empty, purposeless, destructive, and tortured existence here on earth. A living hell. You're walking around breathing and your heart is beating but you're not really alive. By contrast, the Holy Spirit within us helps us to recognize that only in walking according to God's will do we discover true satisfaction and true glory, true freedom and true life. When Paul talks about putting to death the deeds of the body, he uses a word for a continuing action. It's ongoing. Overcoming the flesh is not a one-time event, but a continuing effort in the life of the believer. And the same spirit that empowers us to holy living also empowers us to experience real life in Christ. That is God's sanctifying grace. I talked about it last week. And here it is again. It keeps coming up. It'll keep coming up a lot because it is an ongoing work. It is the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our church family life. Now understand this. Living in the Spirit of God, living according to God's will, is not about obeying a list of rules. And it's certainly not about judging yourself or others for failing to live by certain 
rules. It's about learning to trust God. It's about listening to the leading of the Holy Spirit. It's about growing in love. The Spirit will guide you and help shape your character as you grow in love. Your behavior will change as you grow in love. But love comes first. Turn to your neighbor and tell them love comes first. Love comes first. Love comes first. And then over time, you grow into a Christ-like character and Christ-like behavior. If all you're doing is checking off the rules, well, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm good. If that's all you're doing and thinking that you're accomplishing something significant, you're missing the point. Love comes first. And growing in love leads to life. Now, I understand that sometimes we need rules to help us establish boundaries and to curb our worst impulses. Every law that has ever been written is a response to something stupid or destructive or harmful or damaging or deadly that somebody actually did. Ponder that one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I understand that when raising children and teaching children, you need to give them rules and concrete guidelines. That's just part of the developmental stage that they're in. There is a place and a need for laws and rules and as Paul says, the law is a gift from God. The law is good. But when it comes to living in the Spirit and doing God's will, it's more about growing in character and listening to, the, to God and trusting in God than it is about following the rules. And love comes first. Jesus said, if you just focus on two things, two things, love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Two things. If you do those two things, then you have already fulfilled all the law and all the prophets. You do these two things, and you will live. Love comes first, and love leads to life. And so the first gift of being a part of the family of God is life, and we get there by love. By God's love for us, and by our love for God and neighbor in response. The second thing that we receive as members of the family of God is the gift of adoption. So what does it mean to be adopted into God's family. Paul uses an image from Greek and Roman society. Adoption was not practiced by, Jewish, by the Jewish society at that time. It was just not part of Jewish culture. But remember, Paul was a Jew, but he was also a Roman citizen, and he knows Roman law, and so he's using a metaphor that he understands. And according to Roman law, an adopted child is given full rights and privileges of sonship in a family in which he was not a natural member. And I'm using he and son because that's the way the law was written. Females were not acknowledged in the same way in ancient Roman law. And a son was different from a ward or some other pers a person of some other status where they might be taken care of and provided for, but not given full legal rights. The child had no legal or natural claim on membership in the family. 
but received the gift of family through adoption. And an adopted child had full legal status, including the ability to inherit. And likewise, we have no natural claim as God, on God's family. Through our own sin, we have turned and rebelled against the God who created us. And yet, in divine love and grace, God extends a hand to us and reaches out to us and brings us into his family. As members of God's family, we receive all the rights and responsibilities of family membership. And as children, we are also heirs. And Paul does not use this in a material sense. I mean, God doesn't die, so there's no material goods to pass down. Um, but Paul does use this in the sense that we are recognized as occupying a privileged position within the family. And though we have no dignity in and of ourselves, God bestows on us a unique dignity that comes from being a member of his family. So the second gift we receive is the gift of adoption. The third thing we receive uh, as being a part of God's family is the gift of future glory. Some historians in the early 1990s talked about the world having reached the end of history in the sense that we were achieving the culmination of human achievement through the spread of democracy around the world. You think back 30 years, what do you think about that statement? The culmination of human history, democracy around the world. Human beings have quite the inflated ego, don't we? The 90s were more optimistic. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We like to get to the top of that hill and plant that flag and say, we did it! We won! Yay, us! The culmination of history. Wow. Quite a few million people might question that judgment, as would those still affected by war and conflict and disease and famine and other evidence of a corrupted world. But a day is coming when all of history will reach its climax as God redeems history and creation and ushers in a true new age. Not on our timetable, but on God's timetable. And as member of God, members of God's family, we have been provided a unique, unmerited, unearned opportunity to share in that future glory. What an amazing gift. God created us and through his son our Savior Jesus has redeemed us and reconciled us to him. He has made us members of his family. We are God's children and through his Holy Spirit he continues to grow us in love and grace. He bestows on us the gifts of life, adoption, and glory. And those are only three of the many amazing gifts that God gives us. It is a gift and a blessing to be a member of God's family and to live out that gift as Chamelin. Amen?
invite our ushers to come as we prepare to receive our morning offering.
Amen. We love God by our service, and we lift up opportunities for service uh, this week. Some of the announcements and events and mission opportunities are uh, printed on your order of service and are scrolling on the screen as well. Uh, the, we do feed the children in the community commitment uh, once school starts, but the collection for the food is uh, gearing up for that and so the the list of things that are collected and that are needed for that are printed in the bulletin um, we do have the strength and balance adult exercise class that meets on Tuesdays from 1230 to 130 are there other opportunities for um, service that we need to lift up yes that you do provide, that you provided for me, but also thank you for the ongoing service that you provide for this church and for the community beyond the church. And if you would like to be a part of that group that is uh, serving others here in the church and beyond, you can come on the third, third Tuesday and join with them in that ministry. Are there others that we would lift up for uh, opportunities for service and ministry? The choir and music. The choir and music. Yes, if you if you have if you yeah, want to come really sing. Like yes. If you if you have a voice or uh, or uh, play an instrument, please come and be a part of the music ministry of this church. It's a vital part of our worship, and it's a part, vital part of the service and ministry that this church provides as well. Now I invite us to join together in our commitment prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, with your help, we will love our neighbors by doing no harm and by doing good. We will love you by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. In Jesus' name, amen. And may the grace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit surround you and fill you, bless you and uphold you, and may you go forth to love and serve the Lord with joy. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. amen.